Thank you so much, both of you. Amen. If you want to hear more testimonies, I guess you can come back next service as well. We'll have more of the team each service. Uh, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going I'm to share some of my own thoughts as well. So, Jesus, we just thank you. We thank you that you're real, that you're a real God. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you'll come and make Jesus real today in this place. God, we're not gathered here uh, to go through the motions or go through our routine. We're here to, to be with you, Jesus. And we ask that your presence will fill this place and that you will make yourself known in a powerful and manifest way, we pray in your mighty name. Amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can open them up to uh, 1 John. I'm going to read a few verses and then uh, just share some stories with you all. Uh, but this is, uh, we're going to read 1 John verses 1 through 4. And it says this. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, and what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. And I... Uh, you know, John, he's writing this uh, in, the, in the climate, the kind of the social climate of the day. There's a lot of what we'd call Gnosticism, which was kind of a heresy that he was constantly fighting against, which claimed that Jesus was this spirit and almost this emanation of a human, but he wasn't actually human. He wasn't real. And so John's words here, he's, you know, very poignantly speaking uh, to this kind of spiritualized notion of Christianity and the spiritualized notion of Jesus that wasn't real, that wasn't flesh, that wasn't actually, you know, and he says, what we've heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and that word was made manifest. And he's talking about a real Jesus. It's been rising and more. Uh, my heart, there's just been this very simple prayer that's been rising within me, which is Jesus, like, I, I, I want you to be real. And I'll pray, Holy Spirit, make Jesus real. Like, I want a real Jesus for the real problems and the real situations of my life. I need a real Jesus, the one that I can see, one that I can look at, one that I can touch with my hands, one that is more real then the breath in my lungs. Like, I need a real Jesus. And I think that's the cry of every believer. I think that's the cry. It's why we come to church. I think it's why we go on missions trips. It's why we pray. It's why we read the Bible. It's deep down within us, we're all hungering for a real Jesus. And the gospel is not this spiritualized message. It's about a man named Jesus Christ that died on a cross, went in a grave, and he really resurrected. And he's alive. Like, he's alive, you know, and, and even that, sometimes I think we spiritualize. Um, and oftentimes in Western, there's this, as I've kind of divided my life and divided my time between the global south and the Western world, I have this, it's like this dichotomy that has been really interesting to navigate um, where I just find myself that there's such this intellectual divide of the globe and a scientific, rational mind that I've inherited as a Western citizen of the globe. And I don't, I think those things are very good. Uh, I think that it's, I'm not against science, I'm not against ration, uh, but I'm also aware that there is more than what we can see and perceive with our five senses. Like, in, and then part of the, the postmodern world that we're living in is that we've recognized that science isn't going to save us from the destruction of this world. You know, and, and most people think that the postmodern shift was triggered when the nuclear bomb was dropped and more people died in a single day than it had any, than all the wars, you know, um, than any war in human history. And so the science that we thought was going to save us 
has been more destructive in some regards than all the hope that it offered. And we're left in this world now trying to figure out, you know, what is truth, what is real, and what's going to save the world from the pain that we're experiencing. And I I, I say this all to say, as I'm going to, I just felt the Lord, I, I often won't share a lot of testimonies um, that I see when I'm in India. I'll let the team share and I'll share ones here and there. Um, but I felt the Lord say, tell them tell him what I did. And I'm going to just share just a handful of honestly the testimonies that I can remember. I honestly saw so many in this trip that I, um, I've probably forgotten half of them because it's like a blur. Um, but I'm going to share some testimonies of what a real Jesus did, and, and, I, and I believe that Jesus wants to come and make himself more real for us tonight as well. Um, so is that okay? Yeah. I'm hoping to just stretch your paradigm a little bit and cast vision that there's more than what we've seen, there's more than what we've tasted, there's more than what we've heard. Jesus is real and Jesus is alive, and he's the same today, yesterday, and forever, and he's the same Lord in India that he is tonight in Boise, Idaho. Right, and so I just wanna, I just wanna wet your appetite, I guess, for for more, because my my appetite's wet myself. Um, but I'll just start. Uh, There's a testimony when I was there in November. Um, I was preaching at a very small little church, and I had a word of knowledge about someone that had been in an accident, and as a result was crippled and couldn't walk. And there's like 25 people in this church. I'm like, all right, someone in here, and, and this guy stands up. He couldn't walk. He came up for prayer, and the Lord said, "Don't lay hands on him. Tell him to walk." So I said, can you walk? <laughs> and he walked out and uh, literally visibly his limp went away, which I thought was awesome. Um, but sometimes you're still like, you know, left to ponder. But anyways, that man was back. They had him and he shared his testimony and they have it on video now. Uh, it wasn't just a limp. The limp was caused because when he got in an accident, it injured his brain. He had a, a, a blood clot that was causing a lot of damage in his brain. And it was in a very sensitive area of the brain. So the doctors, he'd been in pre-surgery meetings, and the doctors didn't know if the surgery would help him. And they thought there was just as much of a chance that the surgery was going to paralyze him because of where the clot was. And anyways, when he walked and got healed, he went back to the doctor, and his brain uh, was completely cleared, <laughs> scot-free. <laughs> yeah, that, that was cool. That was cool. Um, I, on uh, Thursday morning before we flew home, um, Thomas, um, Pastor Thomas, who's kind of the, one of the leaders there, he said, hey, brother, I have a testimony for you. I said, okay. He said, when you were on the stage Sunday night, I, I uh, got a word of knowledge. And again, you know, I'm hoping I'm hearing from God most of the time. Uh, it's not like, yes, I heard from God. But um, what I heard was someone had been in a car accident and injured their back. So I just called that out. It was like probably a thousand people um, there the last night. So it's not like you talk to everyone. Uh, but he said, I got a phone call this morning from a Pastor Samuel that lives um, a ways away who came to the meeting. He said, when you spoke to that, he had just experienced, he was in a car accident, he'd broken his back. He said, the word of the Lord entered into him and he received, and he, his pain left his back. He said, but he didn't come and testify that night because he wanted to go to the doctor first and make sure. So he said he went to the doctor yesterday, got scanned, completely cleared, his back's healed, and uh, the word of the Lord healed him. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's crazy. I'm just going to share what comes to mind. Um, but I had this, this old man, probably like 75. I think it was the first night of the meetings. I just I prayed a corporate prayer for healing. Um, oftentimes we'll pray kind of a corporate prayer, and, and then people will come up afterwards as well. But this guy comes up to me. He's got this, like, picture of, like, the nastiest foot, like this surgery with all these stitch marks. And uh, he's like, huh, here, but he, and I don't understand him. And uh, the translator goes, he's telling you this is what happened to his foot. And when you prayed, the pain left and he's healed. And literally, I mean, I wish I had the picture. I didn't pray enough in head, but it's like this. It looks like a multiple fractures on his foot. And he was praising God. And I was like, well, you're walking? And he's just walking back and across the stage scot-free. Um, and I was just like, Jesus, this is, this is crazy. Um, I had another woman that came up, and I had prayed a corporate prayer, and she had fractured her knee, um, and they said she couldn't walk here tonight, but now she's limping because something happened in her knee when you prayed, but she's still in pain. So then I was with, uh, I, I usually had someone with me, and then we put hand on her knee, 
And then uh, I said, can you walk now? And she was limping visibly, and then she limped, and then she just started walking. <laughs> and she was like this. And I was like, are you in pain at all? And she was like, no, and hallelujah. I said, like, can you do that one more time? And she was like, yes. So she just walked across the stage and walked back, and I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> this was probably my favorite story. Um, it wasn't a healing, but I had this little 14-year-old girl come up to me, and sweetest little thing, and I was sitting on a chair at this point because I'd probably been praying for like an hour, hour and a half on the stage, and my back was killing me. So I was just sitting on this chair, and she came up, and I said, okay, give me your hands, and I put her hands um, Put her, put her hands in my hands, and as soon as I touched her hands, she just, boom, collapsed on the ground. And then she started, <sighs> and I, I just knew, I was like, she's seeing Jesus right now. And uh, so the translator, I just told her, I said, just tell her to stay and just listen for what Jesus is saying. And she probably stood down on the ground for uh, probably a good five minutes. And when she got up, her face looked like terrified, and she just... I'm going to get emotional because she just seen a ghost. It was crying, crying, and her face just looked like she'd seen a ghost. And I knew she'd seen a ghost. It was just a holy ghost. And, uh, and she starts speaking to me through the translator, tears just pouring down her face. She said, Jesus spoke to me. And she starts telling me, he told me that I'm going to be his servant and started just telling me. And, thing, and her little face, just tears just pouring down. And I don't know why, but it just wrecked me. I was like a mess after that for the rest of the night. Um, another a woman came up to me, and she had intense stomach pain, so she has a lot of stomach burning. And then the back story she told me as well, she said, I'm a, I'm a Christian she said, my whole family is Hindu, and they, they curse me, and they, they force me to go to the temples with them, and I won't worship their gods, but, but they force me to come sometimes, and they're trying to force me to marry a Hindu man. It was just, just like, you know, pray for me, and, and she's like, and then I always have intense burning and intense burning in my stomach and stomach pain. So as I was praying, um, normally it's hard to describe, but there's, there's a lot of like a cult there. There's a lot of, they're worshiping these, these other, um, other gods, um, very openly. And, um, so I just, I've gotten to the point where I can usually discern if there's a demonic presence and uh, I could discern that there was. So I started leading her in some prayers of repentance and her family worshiped a God that's like a, a snake. And so, um, as she starts repenting, then I start praying the blood of Jesus, and then uh, she began, like, manifesting, um, and, and I could feel that the God was starting to work, and then she starts speaking um, in her language, and I'm asking the, the translator, I'm like, okay, hey, what's she saying? She's saying, uh, and she was saying, I, the snake standing in front of me, she had her eyes closed, she's like, and he's speaking to me, and he's saying, if you make me leave, you're going to die, and I'm going to take your life. And so I was like, okay, just tell her that's not true. And I keep praying, I keep praying. And then she starts speaking again. I'm like, what's she saying? And it got to the point where like, I really didn't have to pray anymore. So I'm just like brought into this conversation. I was like, what's she saying? She says, now I see Jesus and the snake. And I said, what is Jesus saying? And she said, don't be scared. <laughs> I said, okay, that's good. I said, just tell her to say, Jesus, come in. Jesus, come in. So she's like, Jesus, come in. She starts praying the prayer, and she's like, and then she starts speaking again. I said, now what's she saying? She said, she's saying the snake's talking again. I said, what's the snake saying? She said, why don't you want me anymore? <laughs> I'm not making this stuff up. I was like, man, if that's not like a defeated enemy, I don't know what is. Why don't you want me anymore? And I said, tell her to the presence of God to go in Jesus' name. And so she's saying it. And then you could just feel the presence of God so strong. And all of a sudden, it was like she just came to this place of peace. And she was like, I'm healed. My stomach's in no pain. And you could just see her eyes. They were just full of this clarity, full of this joy. And I was like, man, I feel like I just watched Jesus preach the gospel to this lady. Yeah, I was, uh, Josh Richards, if any of you know him, he was with me praying, and he was like, man, dude, right when we started, he said, I just felt like God told me to just step back and watch, and I was like, yeah, I kind of think I got to do the same thing, you know, it was like, I was just like, man, Jesus, you're really good at doing this. <laughs> oh, man. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to share. 
I'm sure the Lord will remind me of things, but I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, at the same time, you see these things that very much take your breath away. They kind of, you know, they, they blow your mind a little bit. Like your mind lacks the capacity to be able to quantify or cognate. Like where do I put that box in? Like where do I put the box that you couldn't walk and you just walked in front of me? You know, like we don't have it. Um, and, it and it can almost sound superhuman, but it's very human. And then at the same time, I'm praying and, you know, for other people uh, that don't get the breakthrough. And honestly, I can be equally as equally disturbed over, um, you know, why don't they get healed when these people do get healed? And I start going back up into my rational mind and my logic and trying to understand, 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 understand. And uh, I feel like Jesus in some ways is just best experienced uh, and he's not always understood. Like it is hard to understand God. It's hard to understand who Jesus is. I think we're going to spend all of eternity more and more and more coming into understanding. Um, but I feel like Jesus is experienced before he's understood. And you have to experience his love. You have to know his love. You have to watch him move. And then there's something about it that actually it like unlocks a place of our hearts to actually uh, know him and understand him. And I think, you know, I always come away from these trips like, wow, you just moved. But also, like, what else can you do? Like, who are you? What else don't I know? Do, do I not me about our engagement with India? You know, bridging, because the Lord, um, the first word he gave me about our engagement with India, he said, I want you to build a, a, a spiritual highway between India and Boise, and I want you to connect. I want there to be unity uh, between these places and a connection with the beauty of the global south with the beauty of what we have to offer in the West. And it's been an awesome combination to watch how... Um, they're getting revived as well, and I could go story after story after story of what God's doing there um, through Riverhouse, through letting our culture loose in that environment, but then there's also this deep impact that we're receiving as well, and I can just tell you that the faith of these people and, and the poverty of their heart, it's like it, it pulls on God. Uh, they don't, they're not coming skeptical for prayer. They're just coming to prayer. And they come really for like any ailment that they're experiencing. They'll come for prayer because there's nowhere else that they're going to go. Like we have the options of do I go to Walgreens? Do I go to the family doc? Do I go to the ER? Do I go to the, like they don't have any of them. They just have one option, which is, I'm going to put my faith in this message you told me of this man, Jesus, and hope that he's real. And uh, it actually works, crazy enough, you know. Um, but I'm disturbed, honestly. I'm disturbed because I feel like part of me comes back home and I miss Jesus. Like there's, uh, there's a part of Jesus I miss when I'm here. And there's a part of Jesus, honestly, I think I miss when I'm there as well. And I'm like, Jesus, I, I want there to be a oneness that you're free to be who you are here at River House, here in the middle of Western society in the same way that you are amongst the poor. Yeah. You know, I think um, Jesus is really comfortable with the poor. He feels at home with the poor. Like the poor don't have ego. The poor don't have agendas. The poor don't have, you know, all this, you know, you got to navigate and step on eggshells and do these things and do it the right way and make sure the service doesn't go quite so long and make sure that everything's smooth and the transitions are perfect and make sure the atmosphere in the room feels really good. And when the new visitor walks in, you know, like this is what we think of in a rich culture. Like poor people don't care about that. They just don't care about that. Like they're hungry. And when you're hungry, you know when you're... You, you know if you're really hungry because you're not really picky about the food that's in front of you. That's when you know you're hungry. I heard this story once of this guy. He was, he was stuck in the middle of the winter, and he was marching like he got, like I, something happened. He broke down. He ended up having to march like 15 miles, finally got through the snow, and this is like 100 years ago, and then got to his cabin, opened up the door, and 
He said he was just so famished that he looked, he found this, uh, found this um, like, uh, food and ate the whole thing and he thought it was the most delicious thing he'd ever eaten and when his like family returned that evening she was like what did you eat and he said that she said that was the horse feed (laughs) he's like I didn't even notice because I was hungry you know and I think when it comes to our spirituality we have new realms to go to and being a hungry people and being poor in spirit and you know, this consumption mindset kind of wreaks havoc, I think, a lot of the times um, because it, it in, in this wealthy kind of rich mindset, uh, it keeps us in this place where we kind of want Jesus on our terms instead of just like, give me whatever you are, you know, like whoever you are, however you are, like, I just want you. And I think it keeps us uh, from seeing the gospel actually play out in our lives. Like, I don't think that this is a, a, a just a history book to be read about. This is a, a living testimony and an invitation into a, a way of living that is above what we think is possible. You know, and, and part of, I think, the epidemic of the Western rational mind is we've taken scripture, which you know, has like some pretty insane standards in it. Like you're going to see the cripples walk (laughs) and we like spiritualize it. And then we bring it down to our level of rational, like cognitive ability. Like this is what I've understood in my life. Like this is what I think is possible. So we take the stories and we kind of just drop it down so that I can feel comfortable. Comfort. That's rich people's talk. You know, a poor person says, yeah, I may have never seen that before, but if you're telling me that God can do this, like, forget my comfort. What does it take to get there? You know, Jake's fired up. I think the rest of you are like thinking, you must be thinking. How much time do I have? It's 43, 30. Okay. I got a little bit of time. Um, and so I just feel like God really wants to keep clearing capacity for us to experience Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is real. Jesus is still healing. Jesus is still doing miracles. Jesus is still speaking. Jesus is still speaking intimate details. Jesus knows every hair that's on our head. Jesus is alive. He's real. He's, he has flesh. He has a body. He has a voice. He, has, he looks like something. He sounds like something. He still walks into rooms. He still manifests. And I don't think that this verse is just like, oh, great. I'm glad that you looked at him and that you saw him and that you knew him and that he was manifested to you. I'm so glad. But they say, no, we actually wrote this so that you can have fellowship with us, so that you can have an intimate union with us because our intimate unions with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So I think John's not just writing about like, hey, listen to what we had here in the Old Testament. He's saying, no, you know, this is from glory to glory to glory to glory. Here's your invitation to come into a dynamic, living relationship with a Jesus that's alive. (laughs) And I believe that God doesn't want to use special people. He doesn't just want to heal people in India because somehow he loves them more. He doesn't. They just, they just right, grace is like water. It flows to the lowest place. And the poor and the hungry and the humble, they'll always get there. They'll, they'll be there at that lowest place. They don't let the fear of disappointment keep them from stepping out to where God does miracles. You know, I think a lot of times we don't see the miracles, we don't see healing, we don't see the movement of God's spirit because we don't walk on water because we don't get out of the boat. (laughs) Well, what if I sink? What are all the people in the boat going to think if I step out in faith and I sink? I've been guilty. Uh, Do I really want to pray for this person? What if they don't get healed? I pray for all the, you know, but what if they do? You know, what if it is God? What if Jesus is wanting to move? You know, the, 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 
I've never seen Jesus move more powerfully in my entire life than I did. It was the second night of the crusade. And I, I, don't, I don't say that lightly. I've never seen Jesus invade a room. And it was probably um, one of the most vulnerable nights of my life. And the Lord said, I, I, it was uh, so much attack was going on. I just was like, oh, my gosh. Like, I don't even want to be here, Lord. Like, I, my mind is a battlefield right now. And I was sitting on the stage about to preach. I literally had no idea what I was going to preach. And uh, he said, I don't want you to preach. He said, I want you to get, your, get on your face. He said, you need more of my spirit. You don't have any words to preach. And he said, and son, he said, it's not about your sermons. He said, you've relied too much on your sermons. He said, you're a good preacher, but people don't need your preaching. He said, they need my presence. He said, get on your face and pray. And I said, Lord, this is going to be really awkward. I said, you think you could, like, deal with my discipline maybe later? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, maybe next week when I'm in the rhythm of River House, you know, we can have, like, a nice, di- I mean, I'll repent. Like, now? And uh, he said, now? So I just got up, I got on my face, and all I could start praying is, Lord, I need more of your spirit. Come make Jesus real. I'm sorry for how I've made my agenda not more than your agenda. I'm sorry for how I've made it about preaching and not your presence. Like, it's just, and, and I just started weeping. And I didn't look up for 15 minutes because I was scared to death. <laughs> I could not make my eyes look up because I thought I was going to see a bunch of, you know, headlights looking at me. Like, oh, man, he's having a moment while everyone else is watching. And uh, the Spirit of God invaded that place. The translator was weeping pretty soon. I don't even think half the team prayed for people that night because they were weeping too. And then turned from weeping to laughing. And, and I think one of the, I think next service, one girl's going to share a testimony of what God did that night and then what happened out of it the next night. Uh, but it was like Jesus was taking me back to this real simple place that it's, it's not about... Uh, it's not about all the nice things. It's not about preaching perfect sermons. It's not about, it's not about all the stuff that I, I've made my life about. You know, it's like you want to do a nice church service. You want everything to be excellent. But it's like, man, Lord, at the end of the day, all I really want is you. All I really want is a real Jesus. And so I'm going to close tonight. We're going to create space, actually, because I think... We need to create more space in our lives, and, and this starts with me. I, I just feel this conviction to start making more space to actually enjoy Jesus at church. I think sometimes we get so in our Western mindset that it's like, I'm expecting to meet Jesus in the songs and in the sermon and maybe at a prayer time at the end. Instead of like, but what if it's just you? It's kind of like what that deliverance was like, well, I don't think I had to do much. You know, it's like Jesus just spoke. Like Jesus is just there. And I want a real Jesus, and I don't want to be in the way of people experiencing Jesus because I'm talking too much. He's good at talking. So these are just thoughts I have. And uh, I just want to create a space and, and really just say uh, as a precedent, That we're going to be a people that leave room for Jesus. That leave room for Jesus at church. That leave room for Jesus when we read the Bible. Sometimes I think we forget the goal is not to know the Bible. It's to know the author. And that when we come to this book, we're not just reading words on a page. We're actually not even in control. We're actually listening. And right now, like if you get on your cell phone, you're going to tick me off because you're not listening to me. It's right now, none of you are in control of what's happening in the room because you're listening. When we're listening, we're actually giving up control. And when we're coming to the word of God, this is a window to look at the eyes of Jesus. But I think sometimes we get so busy reading. And when you're reading, you're in control. I can close the book. I can put it down. I can pick it up. But we don't listen I think sometimes we come to church and we're just singing the songs. We're not listening. When we listen to the word God preached, we're not listening really. We're just kind of in the motion 
We're like doing what we've been conditioned to do week after week after week. And I want a real Jesus. And if Jesus is healing tonight, I, that's what I want to do. You know, if Jesus is wanting to preach, that's what I'm wanting to do. And I'm, I'm not for surprise church in the sense of like, what's going to happen this week? <laughs> is there going to be a bounce house in there? You know, like, I'm for order. But I want Jesus. And I saw him there. And it messes me up. And I'm like, I want you here the same way. So that's where I'm at. And I'm just going to have, uh, Garrett, you can come up and play. And the team that, that went, uh, they're going to be up here. You know what? Forget what. What time is it? You know what? Forget what time it is. We're going to be poor in spirit, and they can just start worshiping the next service. So if you're in here, they're just going to worship at 6 or whatever time we start the next service. But I just want to pray and uh, invite you to join me. And if you want prayer, the team's going to be up here to pray for you. Holy Spirit, I ask that you, you come make Jesus real today Let's come make Jesus real today God we want you Jesus we need a real Jesus for the real life the real difficulties the real trials the real diseases, the real illnesses, the real pains, the real persecutions, the real discord, God, the real life that we're experiencing. We need a real Savior. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you come make him real today in our hearts. Holy Spirit, come convict of anything that's keeping us from, from living in relationship with this beautiful man, Jesus. Anything that's hindering us from hearing his voice, anything that's, that's restricting us from walking with him so intimately through this life. God, anything that's, that's binding us in, in mediocrity or, or, or limiting us, God, through some sort of intellectual paradigms that are keeping him boxed in. We thank you, Jesus, that you don't like being boxed in. And I just give you permission to come and break the box tonight. You can, you can do whatever you want in this place. You can heal in this place. You can speak in this place. You can, you can just manifest all that you are in this place, Jesus. We just want to touch you and see you and speak with you and hear you. And we just give you control right now, Lord. And we listen. We listen. We're listening.
just ask God for hunger and thirst for righteousness. Just put your hands on your heart. And say, Lord, make me hungry, God. Give me the gift of hunger. God, awaken hunger tonight in this room. Awaken hunger and an expectation that you are here in this place. The healer is here. The king of heaven is here. And when you walk in a room, everything changes. If you'd have sinus issues, just, just pray, just put your hands on your sinus and I just pray, be healed in Jesus' name. So I hurt my knee playing volleyball like 10 months ago and something aggravated it this weekend. I, I was just like kind of fumbling around. I actually was in severe pain walking on stage to play during the worship set tonight. And Jordan was talking about all this. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to stand up and go get prayed for it. And I stood up and I was like, it's fine. My leg is fine <laughs> just from preaching.
way that you see fit, Jesus. so caught up in, in this world and I wasn't allowing him to lead and, and the second I just said okay God I, I know I, it's a bigger issue just lead lead first you know I, I'm so analytical and, and I'm a manager and I try to manage my life but God was just saying allow me to manage it and the second I said yeah yeah yeah, you, you do God and my wrist just I just felt felt the joints healed and, and it's better so thank you Jesus 